Well, again, we're thankful to be able to be together and to enjoy this technology to help us understand uh, the Bible and be able to have, I guess we could call it an electronic fellowship. At least we get to be with one another to some extent. We're grateful for the message we just heard and pray that the things that we learn in our time together and our private study will benefit us in living like the Lord. We're studying about Adam. That takes us into Genesis, and Genesis means origins or beginnings. In fact, it's the third word in English in the book of Genesis, in the beginning. I want to talk about that just for a moment because I said last week what we would try to do is draw some lessons from the text we've already investigated to a certain extent, the cursory matter. Uh, I do find it interesting. I'll make this passing remark as Eric was talking about the different views that Jews had on certain things about death. It's interesting to get a chance to read about a whole lot of that stuff because they had some of the most outlandish, superstitious stuff you ever heard. Some of that comes through when Peter's knocking at the door after he's been freed from prison. And it surprises them all so much. Uh, when Rhoda tries to tell them Peter's at the door, they try to say, no, it's his angel. That's some more of that stuff that they had in their view of things. But be that as it may, anytime you begin to trust in man's own think so, there's going to be not only a way that seemeth right to a man, but many ways it will seem right to men. The end thereof are the ways of death. Now, when we're dealing with our situation today in our Western society, we're dealing with a lot of people who simply don't believe in God or whatever it is. They are not oriented to the God of the Bible, to Jesus Christ, to Christianity, even in a denominational sense. Thus, uh, we need to deal with about as basic material as we possibly can. So when we start at the beginning then we well, of the Bible, we start at the um, book of Genesis. And I think we have to do that to make sure that people are where we used to assume them to be when we can't assume that anymore and probably shouldn't have then. We must realize that when we read Genesis and the matter about Adam or anything contained in the book, that um, as to it being true, then that's what we accept it to be. But we also point out to people that we can prove the Bible's true. That's another story. But we need to let that be well entrenched in the minds of anybody we're studying with. The Bible is true. It is God's word. God put it here by his Holy Spirit through men who wrote not of their own volition, but who wrote of their own learning, but who wrote as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, guided them so they would infallibly record these things. So when we study about Adam or anybody else, we're studying about what God said. What God said. Man, then, is the product of God's creation. When you look at the theory of evolution, all you need to do to that is, is simply say, it cannot be proven. It is palpably false. And we need to be bold in saying that. And we need to know what we're talking about and know how to prove the truthfulness of the Bible, that it is the Word of God, and the falsity of the theory of evolution. The word evolution is not a bad word. It just means change. But when it's applied to the way we're using it, and uh, the way uh, it has come to tell us everything got here is another story. I, I want to say that evolution has not been proved, and evolution cannot be proved. It's not scientific, but really it's contrary to science. It's never been demonstrated, and it is non-demonstrable. Those things need to be emphasized, for they're not. And the way a great many people who claim to believe in God and Christ and the Bible is the Word of God approach it, they're not bold in their statement. 
Uh, somebody tells me the Bible is not the word of God, I'm going to tell them, oh, no, it is the word of God, and we can prove it. Now, are you serious enough to study it? Uh, so many are. You won't get the first base on that. Furthermore, if the Bible record is true, and it is, then uh, not only is atheistic, we'll call it evolution, not only is it false, but theistic evolution is just as false. Theistic evolution is the view that says, um, you know, God created everything, but the mechanism he used to create it was evolution. Notice, as we've studied about the creation of man, from the beginning, there's our word, from the beginning, God made them male and female, Genesis 127. And that's quoted again in Matthew 19, 9, New Testament, Mark 10, verse 6. Now, watch what you've got when you look at this more closely. He made them male and female. This is distinct maleness and femaleness. And that didn't happen after millions of years of accidental evolutionary development. He made them distinctly male and female. And he did that at the beginning, which seems the logical place to do it. Everything starting that he created, everything that, has, that, that had to be created had to begin. God did not create something which through multiplied millions and millions and millions and you want to put billions and trillions, I don't care how many you want to put on there, years of, of evolutionary progression, finally, finally became male and female. That's what the Bible says. The Bible affirms in the beginning God made them male and female. That's important to emphasize and study with anybody if you're going to approach them, try to convert them to Jesus Christ, to try to deal with the situation we're in today in our society. It should be noted further that God said, let us make man. Let us make man. Now, he, he didn't say, let us make some primordial, infinitesimal, protoplasmic organism, which through multiplied millions of years and evolutionary progression will become man. Not that way. He said, that's what we will do. We will create man. Let us make man. And I would emphasize there that the uh, shows the plurality of the Godhead. He's not saying there's a multiplicity of gods. It simply shows the triistic uh, uh, nature, the triism of God, if you want to call it that. That is, there are three persons. And there's one divine essence. That one divine essence, one God, could not exist without the three persons. So we need to understand that. And that leads us to also to the New Testament, John chapter 4, verse 24, where it says, now in the English translations, or at least some of them say God is a spirit, but God is spirit is what it says in the Greek. God is spirit. He is not material, not fleshly. He's not a created being. Uh, Jesus made it clear, we've referred to this already, that a spirit hath not flesh and bones, which ye see me have, Luke 24, verse 39. Obviously, then, man's being made in the image of God does not mean that man was made in a physical likeness of God. We would do well, I think this is something I don't need to say to anybody in this group, but we would do well to understand we're not just studying this to tell ourselves and learn at this point that God is not physical. What we're trying to say is we know he's not, Bible teaches he's not, 
but we're trying to teach somebody else now who looks at everything from a secular perspective, from a material perspective, who doesn't think beyond that particular matter. And therefore, we need to emphasize, as we do about the Bible, where it came from, how it got here, et cetera, we need to emphasize that God is not like man. There's no use thinking about him like a man thinks about him. And he doesn't think as we do. So the Lord existed in the form of God. I'd like to know more about that. Uh, deity has a form. And we learn from Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, that he has that form. Now, Jesus gave up not being deity, that's the impossibility, but he gave up the form that he possessed before he became flesh. He emptied himself, as it were. I don't understand all about that. But there were changes, but it didn't change his deity. But he put him into a position as we are. He became a man. He couldn't be tempted with evil in the form of deity. James makes that clear. But when he became a man, he put himself into a form where he could be tempted. Satan knew that. So he took upon himself the form of a man, Philippians 2, 6 through 8 again. Obviously, the human form and the form of God must be different. Now, if you want to know more about that, I suggest you serve God as faithfully as possible, love him with all your heart, get to heaven, and a lot of things be revealed. Man has the ability, God gave him that ability, to think. I was interested a while ago when those dead people outside their body running around confusion, not knowing what to do. <laughs> I think a lot of them are still in the body in confusion, running around, don't know what to do. But we have the ability to think. I don't know whether we think much or not, uh, but we ought to. We are to think on these things. We're to reason. And there are laws of reason. That's what we've been trying to study for a long time then. We can spend a lot of time with it. We are made, God made us to reason, and we do it all the time. We, we may never know all of them, how to label everything. And just like a lot of folks speak English, they don't know uh, adverb from an adenoid, anything else, but they get a pretty good job of getting their point across, especially if they really want to. Doesn't mean, though, those things shouldn't be studied. Some people say, well, I just don't think we have to know Hebrew or Greek to go to heaven. Well, I'm glad somebody studied it well enough so we could have it in English. Because well, somebody had to do that. But I'm glad there are those folks who study the law of thought, learn how to use them, check to see if they're reasoning correctly so they can come to a proper understanding. Man is in the moral or rational image of God. I wish I understood more what that means. I do to some extent. But it means then there is, as we talked about many times, that sense of oughtness. Think about it for a minute. You think, we talk about Einstein, people like that being so gifted IQ-wise. Can you imagine the brain power Adam had before any taint of sin ever touched this world. Let me tell you how you can imagine a little bit. He named everything there was in the creation as far as animals. Imagine that. And he remembered it. If he hadn't remembered it, he could have called them whatever. Then he'd have gotten it and he'd had to name them something else. Imagine the brain power Adam had. We'll never know what all the sin did when the knowledge of good and evil entered he violated God's will cut off from God immediately spiritually and then God cut him loose from the tree of life by putting him out of the garden we'll never know all that was like that 
But aren't you thankful that here in the beginning of the Bible, you have all these basics of just how we are here, how we got started, and more than that, the whole thing is designed to lead us back to the tree of life, which is in heaven. God said, and we talked about this some last week, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Genesis 2.18. We said again, meet means suitable. A woman is a compliment. A woman is a compliment. Now, I think a lot of times we see a man, a husband, a father, or we see a woman, a wife, or a mother, and we see how bad they can act and all that kind of thing. Well, that doesn't mean they're living up to what God made them to live up to. Neither have they decided to study God's word, learn how to be what they ought to be. But let's keep that in mind when we see people, even when we deal with ourselves. There's certainly a growth and development to be had by a man or a woman, husband, wife, father, mother, by the study of God's word on our roles that we have, there's room for growth there. But each is incomplete. Here's the point. Each is incomplete without the other. How much over the years have you heard people, even in the church, teaching that about wives and husbands? I don't think you do like you ought to. But now look at where we are today. Look at where we are today. How many people think much at all about marriage? About the role of a man, what God meant a man to be, and then a husband, and then the father, and the same of a wife, of a woman, wife, and mother. Well, somebody needs to teach it. God certainly has put it in the Bible. It's all brought out here in the very first book. Seems to me if you're going to try to convert somebody to Christ, they need to know what God expects of them as a man when you marry as a husband and children come along as a father, the same of the woman, wife, and mother. So each is incomplete without the other. Now, now think about that further. Each is incomplete. In what sense? Physically, mentally, socially, Spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, we ought to think about that. Because God made the woman to be as the woman is, and I don't think I could tell him how to improve them. And we may have a view of whatever opposite sex it would be, male or female, and there's lots of jokes made about it all the time, but now ask yourself this. From whose mind did man come? And from whose mind did the woman come? So we have to be careful about how we deal with this, lest we form a view that is far below and contrary to the Lord's will on the matter and his view. Each one, male and female, husband and wife, has the obligation, and I underscore that word obligation, help the other along the road to eternity. People don't give any thought about that nowadays. It may help them on the road somewhere, but in this life, so many of them, they help them on the road to the wrong place in eternity. The sacred, and I deliberately use the word sacred, the sacred story of Adam includes many significant facts with regard to the home as God designated it and revealed what he wanted it to be. Again, in this secular world, the home is of divine origin. It should be treated as that. It was God himself who said, it is not good that man should be alone. It was God himself who made the woman for the man. Um, Men ought to think very carefully about that before they denigrate the woman. She has her place. I have my place as a man, and so it is with everybody. But it was God who designed that woman to be like she is. 
And I don't think you got the design wrong. And then you know the reason I don't think that? Because he's God, and that's all I need to know. You know, all that God is implied to be. It was God himself who in, we can say, solemn and sacred matrimony presented the woman to the man. And it was God himself who said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 224, and Jesus uttered the same thing again in his ministry in Matthew 19 and verse number five. It's God's plan for the parties to be, to the marriage, to be joined together in a wonderful love, mutual affection, each realizing that as they perform as God intended them to as husband and wife, they will be a blessing to one another. I think... Um, and we've heard this before. I don't think I'm giving people anything new here. But I think now as I emphasize it, certainly the world around us doesn't think much about this. And you see what's happened to marriage and family. But Adam's love for his bride is indicated, I think, one of the most beautiful statements in all the Bible. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And likely, it was because of his great love for his bride that Adam deliberately chose to violate the law of God. Think about that for a minute. We studied last week how the woman was in transgression. She was the one that was deceived. Adam just took from her and ate. So we can see what kind of devotion there ought to be between a husband and a wife and a wife and a husband. We'll never know a lot of things about all that transpired, but we know this much. What God has revealed is sufficient for what he intended to do with it and what we need. It's God's plan that in the family unit, there would be one husband and one wife. And that's always been God's plan, always been God's will. We learn from Matthew 19 in the New Testament because the hardness of the hearts of different people. Uh, God tolerated some things and allowed for other things to take place, but he never intended that to be a permanent matter any more than he intended the law of Moses to be permanent or the patriarchal age to be the only age in which he would deal with man. He knew very well these things are temporary and they fit the situation at that time. But God didn't want Israel to have a king. But he had regulations for that king set up in the law. It's God's plan that there be children in the home. God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiply. It's tragic in many cases that there are no children in the family unit because really the home is to that extent incomplete. I read in Psalm 127 and verse number three, Psalm 127, verse three, that children are in heritage of God. A lot of responsibility. Parents have a terrible obligation. Nevertheless, that's what the Bible says. Thus, when all works as God's will teaches it ought to work, then we have what God intended as the largest and smallest unit of society. Now, in the divine account of Adam, we have God's explanation to mankind as to why there was a need for the scheme of redemption. Now watch in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, 
the account is given as follows. First, God made a place for man to live. Second, man was made as well as his bride to live there. Third, God put them in that prepared place. Fourth, it's amazing at the marvelous blessings and privileges that he poured out upon them. Fifth, he gave them a positive divine law. Of course, six, they violated this particular law. Satan, of course, was involved in all of that. And then seven, through this transgression, sin made its entrance into the world. Now, that ruined everything. And I say again, I don't think any of us today could ever conceive of a world without sin, the consequences of sin. But there was a time that was the case. Think, think with me just for a moment. Think of a, of a young man and woman. They are adults, able to procreate. Yet they don't even recognize their nakedness. They have no shame about it. Because there's no sin. And on and on you could go. But that was the case, Adam and Eve. And I, I can't form that in my mind of adults. But that's the way it was. I can accept the fact of it and the inspired fact of it. Now, Paul stresses this in Romans 5, 12. Therefore, as through one man sin into the world, death through sin, so death passed for all men. Now, we've said that, I guess, in every time we've been studying this. Because the devil was successful in injecting uh, sin and death, both physical and spiritual, into the world as a consequence of the terrible tragedy in the Garden of Eden. Every human being is born into a world where sin is, and thus the consequences of sin where death is. Every human being of normal I don't know how to say it otherwise, functioning mind, and who lives long enough, reaches a time and a condition in life in which that person can be distinguish between the right and the wrong. Now, I don't know when that time is, speaking of chronological age, but here's one more I'll put with it. Nobody else does either. And for people to say that 12 years old is the time that people come to understand right from wrong or 13 years old or 14 or nine, a lot of things depend upon a person developing in such a way as to know right from wrong. But at some point, that person will come to know right from wrong, and when that happens, that person will transgress God's law. That's how sin enters the world. Because he's attained accountability to God at coming to know right from wrong. When an accountable person transgresses the law of God, he thereby becomes a sinner. Why? For sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verse 4. And it is the case of every accountable, regarding every um, accountable person, that they violate God's law and thus become the sinner. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Now, you could develop this further, but if you're studying with somebody to try to convert them, then here in the book of Genesis is a place to talk about sin. Talk about the need of a, redeem, of a redeemer. Because everybody that's a human being, having reached the age of accountability, is sin, and no man can save another man, that is a mere man, can't do it. So then as you start in Genesis, you start down through the whole Bible, so there is the gradual, down through the history of man, the unfolding of how God would save man. And you can build on that, of course, as you go on through uh, the Old Testament, as you head for 
um, the New Testament. So we need to be ever grateful for the privileges of engaging in, in uh, honorable labor because you can see before, before there was uh, sin that man had an obligation in his pure sinless state to dress the garden and keep it, subdue the earth. I didn't make this comment last week. We were talking about that, but I will now. We are so upset and we have our shields up against all of the people on the left who are always trying to talk about all of the stuff in the physical world that needs to be protected and that and the other. But there's a legitimate concern that God says is ours as man. He's, we, can, we can waste this world or we can use it correctly. So just because we're opposing people who occupy positions philosophically, politically, in other ways that throws them off somewhere far away from the truth of God, doesn't mean there's not a legitimate concern that godly people have for this world in view of the fact of what God told us to do in it. Now, we recognize that. I think everybody listening to me right now has tried to raise some sort of plant, try to take care of a garden or something. Well, we realize that to have a garden of vegetables and so on, whatever kind they are, you have to cultivate it. You have to take care of it, but you won't get anything out of it. You have to run the pest out of it. You have to get the weeds out of it. You have to fertilize it, whatever. Well, if I can realize that about a garden, then do we understand a little bit better about what God said man's duty is to this whole world? That we do have an obligation to take care of. But just don't be let off in some of these wild schemes that nice God and all sorts of other things that go along with what we hear about nowadays. But work is one of those things that also needs to be dealt with in converting somebody. We are living in a society that is quickly saying it's right to have everything free. Well, truth of the matter is, there's nothing free. Not a thing in the world free. It's all bought by somebody. And the Bible has much to say about working. Think of Thessalonians 3.10, if any will not work, neither let him eat. Well, I suggest that's been forgotten by a whole lot of folks. I've known of folks who drive very nice cars, very polite and decent people, but they go to wherever there's food giveaway to get their freebies. Now think about that mentality. They don't need it, but it's free. Nobody else could use it, maybe better than they could, but since it's free, they go get it there. Well, that's a mentality. It needs to be changed. The word of God does it. And the church is preaching the gospel, being the leavening influence for good and the light of the world. We need to know how to live here so that we can be in heaven someday. Part of that means how we learn to work. So man's ability to deal with idleness is something that's important. The old saying, an idle mind's a devil's workshop, has a lot of truth to it. This is true with regard to individuals. It's true with regard to society in general, to government, and it's true regarding congregations where brethren are working with the right attitude toward that work under the authority of Christ, knowing why they're here as Christians. They have neither time nor inclination for feuding and fussing and fighting. Well, all of that can come out of our study of origins, the beginning. All these things are implied when God tells them to dress, keep the garden, do all these things. What does that imply about their capabilities and ability and God's, God's realization of what they need? All 
those persons really serious about doing what we call personal work, I think can learn a great deal from the devil by simply considering how he approached Eve. Do we ever think of it this way? The devil converted Eve from right to wrong. Now we're concerned, or we ought to be, about converting people from wrong to right. Thus, number one, we must be careful to approach the person to be taught in the right way at the right time. That means you got to observe some situations about them. Another point is, number two, it's good to begin with a question which will capture the attention, which will uh, hopefully arouse their interest. In other words, there's a lot of thought behind ever reaching somebody before you have a Bible study. Another point is, number three, we must be careful to listen to the person with whom we desire to study and while we're studying. Remember what we pointed out about Satan? Satan, listen to Eve. And then the fourth point is we must seek to cause the person to fear the possibility of being lost eternally. That is especially true these days. And then point number five, we must explain to them the marvelous and wonderful blessing God has provided for those who love him, those who obey him. And I want to um, place special emphasis on this final reward, heaven itself. God does not intend for us to be here forever. We need to make people realize that when they cease living on earth, they do not cease existing. And above all of this and every one of these, we must be able, I want to underscore the word able, to prove our claims and to prove it, approve them from the word of God. So our prayer should be that we ask God to help us to see the importance of the right kind of work, what's necessary to convert a person, and especially in our day and age. Adam and Eve, after their sin, and I don't think we'll have much time to get into that now, but uh, first thing, they came to know that they were naked. Why do they know before him? That's that part I don't fully understand. They came to know they were naked. We're going to elaborate on this more when time allows. I won't try to go further. I think we're getting close to the end of it. Anybody does have a question, just hit JD up and he'll bring it to our attention. So we'll call it quits here. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this time together in the study of, of Genesis, especially of Adam. All the blessings we can glean from that, which will help us teach others the truth and live in harmony with thy will. Guide us on through the night. Be with us in all things to serve thee faithfully. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.